Hi there, my name is Nora Bensahel. I'm the Deputy Director of Studies and a Senior Fellow at CNAS. And it is my great privilege to introduce Lieutenant General David Barno, retired from the US Army. General Barno is a highly decorated military officer with over 30 years of service. In 2003, he was selected to take command of the 20,000 US and coalition forces in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. From 2006 to 2010, he served as the director of the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. And since 2010, he has been a senior fellow and senior advisor at CNAS. Today, he will present a TED-style talk called Silicon Iron and Shadow, Three Wars That Will Define America's Future. We will break for lunch immediately after his talk, so we won't have time to take questions. But he will be available to answer questions after the talk and throughout the lunch break. General Barno. Well, thanks, Norrin. It's great to be here today to uh, talk about a little bit about the future that we're wrestling with that many of our uh, speakers have already highlighted here this morning. Uh, delighted to welcome Senator Warner joining us here today as well. Uh, again, one of the great supporters of CNAS who's been a key part of many of our programs, especially in the natural security space. So today I'm gonna talk a bit about an extension of a piece that I wrote for foreign policy dot com back uh, earlier this spring. And it generated a fair bit of interest in, in Washington and, and around the uh, defense circles. So I want to expand on it a little bit and, and use it as a way to connect uh, many of our remarks by speakers earlier today, to including Secretary Carter and our panel, to where we really see the future purpose of the Defense Department, in a sense, going. Because DOD, after all, is about providing the military capability necessary to deter and defeat threats in the future. Uh, and so what is that future going to look like? And I'm gonna describe each of the three wars uh, as though they were distinct. Wars of Silicon, which I think are new and really unique to this century in many ways. And they're going to expand in their impact and dimensions and have a greater and greater influence on military thinking and military operations. Wars of Iron, which will be recognizable to all of you uh, really a descendant of the wars of the latter half of the 20th century. And then finally, wars in the shadows, uh, which in many ways are the wars that the United States in particular has been deeply immersed in for the last decade and has had a, I would think, a distortive effect in a bit on how we think about our current capabilities and our future. So we'll talk about each of those, but I would, I would highlight they're not separate and distinct. They're actually a Venn diagram, an overlapping series of circles. And I'll try to make clear today that each of the conflicts we can expect to see in the future will really almost inevitably involve all three of these wars, silicon, iron, and shadows. In a sense, maybe the most salient recent example of that uh, was the Israeli war in South Lebanon in 2006, where we saw the relatively conventional Israeli military, a very high-end military for its region, fighting against a shadowy insurgent group in Hezbollah, but one that wasn't operating as a guerrilla force, but was using high technology with drones, anti-ship missiles, and, and operating in very asymmetric ways that made it a very tough fight for the Israelis. That same force today, Hezbollah, is now operating with cyber hackers and has the ability to operate in cyberspace as well. That's the nature of these three overlapping Venn circles. But first, I'm gonna start with a tale of two airplanes. How many air power enthusiasts do we have in the room here today? I know there's a few, absolutely. I'm one of them, yeah, believe it or not, as an Army guy. Uh, and I want to talk about um, one airplane that's probably going to be recognizable and one maybe not. How many of you recognize this airplane behind me? These are the diehards, the absolute diehards. Now, only the ones that stay out at the Udvar Hazy at the Smithsonian on the weekends and hang out in the, in the displays. This is the uh, US Army Air Corps P-12, and it was the state of the art of US military technology and aviation in the year 1932. Uh, this aircraft, and also produced uh, for the US Navy as the F-4B, uh, was the best of its class. Uh, it had a wingspan of 30 feet. It weighed about 2,600 pounds. It was powered by a 500 horsepower WASP or Hornet engine. Uh, it had a ceiling of 26,000 feet and it was armed with two 30 caliber machine guns that were operated by the pilot who sat in an open cockpit and fired those machine guns through the propeller in a synchronized fashion. 
What was particularly notable about this aircraft, with, with a top speed, by the way, of a robust 190 miles an hour, you know, best in its class. But what was particularly unique about this aircraft that you'll all recognize, it's an aluminum biplane. It's the first biplane that really made the transition from fabric covered wings to aluminum covered wings, and also an aluminum infrastructure that made it much lighter. Uh, the US military between 1928 and 1932 bought 586 of these aircraft, and they were our frontline fighter during that period of time. Uh, this was the pinnacle of military aviation technology, and all of you will recognize it was the direct you know, descendant and the most improved version of the World War I uh, dogfight fighters. Uh, this is it, aluminum, high speed, uh, very capable, but still very much reminiscent of what the last war looked like. How about this airplane? How many of you recognize this one? Built a bit more recognizable. This is the Messerschmitt 262 jet fighter. Uh, it flew operationally for the first time in 1944, about 12 years after our P-12 was the top of the line U.S. Army Air Corps aircraft. The ME-262 is a bit different from the P-12. It weighed about 26,000 pounds. It had a ceiling of about 37,000 feet, 10,000 feet higher than the P-12. It was obviously powered by two turbojet engines for the first time in the history of combat aircraft. that produced a tremendous amount of horsepower that allowed it to fly not at 190 miles an hour, but at 550 miles an hour. Uh, and its pilot uh, in a closed cockpit was able to operate and kill U.S. bombers over Europe with four 30-millimeter cannons, not a small caliber 30 machine gun. This was a game changer in air warfare. This changed the dynamics in the skies over Europe, and it was incredibly destructive to U.S. strategic air power in 1944 and 45. Fortunately, only 1,400 were produced, and most of those were produced far too late in the war and used in the wrong ways to be decisive against the United States. But it's important to recognize that 80 years ago, in the space of a dozen years, we went from what we thought was the pinnacle of technological capability, an aluminum biplane, to the ME-262 jet fighter, which was on no one's drawing boards in 1928 or 1930, wasn't part of our mental structure of the future of air warfare. And when it arrived on the scene very rapidly, very unexpectedly, it changed the game. Think about that relative to how fast technology is moving today. In my pocket, I'm carrying, as almost all of you are, an iPhone. Uh, this, as one of my sons said, changed my life, changed most of our lives. It didn't exist 10 years ago, didn't exist five years ago. And, and that part of technology in particular is moving at warp speed. And that's what the future is going to look like for us. So let's think about what wars are going to look like in that future. How, how are we going to avoid being the, the nation that operates the aluminum biplanes of 2030. So I'd start with wars of silicon. The wars of silicon, again, I think are the newest, really unique form of warfare we're seeing come out of the scene. And, and cyber warfare is a crucial component, although not the only component, as I'm going to point out, of wars of silicon. Uh, there's a great new piece in Vanity Fair coming out here in July called Silent War by Michael Gross. Uh, and I would commend it for all of you to take a look at to get a feel for how fast cyber warfare is moving. And Michael Gross in his piece essentially makes the assertion, and you can decide whether you buy it or not, that the Stuxnet virus and the deployment of the Stuxnet virus, uh, which ostensibly caused not only great disruption inside the Iranian nuclear program, but also caused ACDC music to play at night on their computers, which drove them crazy. Uh, <laughs> That, that that was really opening the door on this new form of warfare. And, and Michael charts out some events that I hadn't really paid much attention to over the last 12 months. Uh, in August of last year, August 15th, 2012, in the Saudi Aramco oil facilities in Saudi Arabia, which is a Saudi national oil company, in one fell swoop, 30,000 personal computers had their hard drives wiped clean. And, and the only thing that was left on the computer after the wiping was done was a burning American flag. Uh, this was a, attributed to a group that's very shadowy, doesn't really have any background to it, uh, called the Cutting Sword of Justice. Uh, again, not clear entirely, and this is the nature of cyber warfare, where this came from, but it was the most catastrophic attack 
on personal computers that destroyed data that we've ever seen. One month later in New York, we had a, a significant denial of service attack on the US banking system. 12 different American banks hacked into the New York Stock Exchange attack and had a significant disruption in their ability to do business for a couple of days. Again, the uh, hackers behind that, not entirely clear, advertised themselves as the Syrian Electronic Army, which no one had ever heard of before or since. Uh, so again, the ability for foreign entities, presumably, to reach into critical capabilities and disrupt them is tremendously dangerous and increasing rapidly. Finally, in April of this year, just two months ago, starting here in Washington, all of you will recall this, that we had a hack into the AP Twitter feed that said, breaking news, two explosions at the White House, uh, Barack Obama injured. And in the space of minutes, the New York Stock Exchange plunged about 150 points, and about $180 billion of value was lost in the stock exchange in the following minutes before it was recovered uh, through one hack on one Twitter feed for one media outlet. So think about the implications of that as we think about warfare and the vulnerabilities of our society to warfare going down the road into the future. Now, it's more complex than that, and, and wars of silicon are not simply cyber warfare. What worries me both, and I think going right back to the U.S. military, the principal challenge in front of the U.S. military now is thinking not about how do we include cyber warfare in our domain of air, sea, space, and land, but how do we deal with a potential adversary or more than one adversary that combines high-end cyber capabilities, large and capable conventional forces, tremendous resourcing, who's going to have a larger economy in the United States. China comes to mind as a concern in this arena, and there's going to be others that are going to catch up to the U.S. in economic wherewithal to apply to the military. And finally, you know, highly capable military technology. So large conventional forces, high technology, including cyber, and lots of resources to apply to the problem. We have not had this challenge as a nation, I would argue, certainly since the Cold War, when the Soviet Union was churning a very large military machine, although not a sophisticated one against U.S. interests, perhaps not back until World War II. And, and so I would argue that since 1989, the U.S. military, while, while not having to fight against the low bar, has certainly had a lowered set of sight expectations for what kind of adversary they might face and what kind of capabilities they might bring to the table. So I think that's a concern. I'm going to go to, the, at the end of the speech, come back and talk about what we need to change, where we need to think about our investments, perhaps, a bit differently because of this domain. So that's our first war, uh, wars of silicon. The second wars are well known to all of you, wars of iron. And I spent most of my military career uh, in a military that was fixated on wars of iron, that was preparing to fight the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union on the plains of Western Europe, uh, that was all about symmetrical conflict uh, against an enemy that was very much equipped, armed, some ways trained the same way we were, and we were very good at that. Uh, I would argue that we still dominate that space today, that we have greater abilities than anyone in this conventional state-on-state -state sphere. And there are still going to be wars of iron. That is not going away, and the U.S. has got to remain prepared for those wars. How we balance our investments there is a different question. But today, a war against uh, Iran, a potential conflict involving Syria, a war with North Korea would very much be wars of iron, but they'd be different kind of wars of iron. They, they wouldn't look like, say, Saddam Hussein's invasion of, of Kuwait in uh, 1990. They wouldn't even look like our response in Desert Storm. As one example, if we went to Korea and we ended up fighting a war that was pre predominantly a conventional war, we could very much expect to see in that war not only having to deal with a million North Korean military capabilities, artillery, rockets, tanks, uh, large armored formations. But we would also be dealing with cyber hackers that we know the North Koreans are already deploying to disrupt infrastructure in South Korea. We'd be dealing with some selected high-end technological capabilities. I think we could expect to see GPS jamming. Uh, we could expect to see other disruptions of our command and control networks, maybe even some impact on our space capabilities coming from the North Koreans, of all people. And then finally, we would see that the third domain, in a sense, the wars of shadow. They, they have 100,000 100, commandos trained to infiltrate the South and disrupt uh, society and military operations there. So that is another 
hybrid war, but one built around a large conventional confrontation. That's what wars of iron are going to look like, I think, for the rest of certainly the next 30 or 40 years. There will be combinations of selected elements, even in countries with fairly limited technology. You'll see elements of that, both cyber and high-end technology, pulled into their capability set, as well as irregular warfare. That said, the U U.S. dominates this space. Uh, we are larger and unquestionably more capable than not only most of the adversaries out there, but almost all of our friends. Uh, I like to point out for our Marine friends in the audience today, the U.S. Marine Corps today uh, at about 198, 200,000 Marines is larger than the entire British military. The Marines fly more fighters than the RAF. Uh, they have more tanks than the British Army. And they're broadly an incredibly capable force, and it's our smallest service. Uh, and we're comparing that with the entire military of one of our principal allies out there. We own this space, and we will continue to do so in the future. Uh, and we may over-own this space, which I want to come back to at the end. Finally, wars in the shadows. And again, very recognizable to all of you. Uh, we've been fighting war in the shadows, certainly since 9-11, and the tremendous growth in our capabilities there from drones uh, to special operations forces to an intelligence apparatus as we've all seen now, that's second to none in the world and has the ability to look deeply into potential adversaries all around the world. This, this is another arena where the U.S. has got very strong capabilities. But we're also going to be dealing with emerging, growing, and evolving threats there. As al-Qaeda may diminish in terms of its core capabilities, we're seeing mesticized versions of that spreading around the world. We're dealing with individual radicalization. We're also dealing with super-empowered individuals who can now leverage capabilities off the internet, very much non-state actors, to wreak havoc, whether it's a Boston bombing uh, or some type of disruption in cyberspace that can be driven as easily by an individual as it could be driven by a nation state. So th this space, again, is one where the U.S. will have to continue to play a significant role, but will do so in ways that perhaps cause us to balance a little bit differently in the future. So what do we do about all this? You know, these are the three wars. What shape are we in with regard to these wars, and where do we go next? I would make the argument that we're at a forcing function fork in the road, if you will, today. And much of that is driven by the opportunity that several speakers have noted of, of the defense budget facing another half trillion dollars in cuts over the next nine to 10 years. Uh, that concentrates the mind, much like a hanging in two weeks. Uh, and it's going to pro pro provide the Defense Department perhaps the only opportunity in the next decade to make some dramatic changes. And, and I, I think I might posture this in terms of change and in investment in this way, that we're, we need to think about how we're making decisions and investment on today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. In the space of today, I think the cuts are, are preeminent right now. We're worried about that. And today, I'd say perhaps now out to the next five years or so, tomorrow, I would define maybe out to 10 to 15, and then out 20 years and beyond is, is the day after tomorrow. I, so as we look at today, these cuts are driving the dialogue here in Washington, D.C., recognizably so. We, as was noted by uh, a couple folks, we just published a paper, The Seven Deadly Sins, that talks about how to drive down costs, because part of what we have to do as a nation, given these three wars, is reduce the cost of being able to respond across this spectrum. And the way we have to do that, in, in my judgment, is not simply by cutting fighter planes and artillery battalions and drawing down our fleet. We need those capabilities. That's why we have a Defense Department. What we have to do is look at the underlying cost drivers in the Defense Department. And there's basically about two of those. One is the Defense Back Office, which Secretary Hagel's already talked about, and we define a number of ways to cut that. And then the second is military pay benefits and health care which, as we all know, is consuming a greater and greater portion of the defense budget. As two studies have now shown in town, by 2030, that is the entire defense budget. So we've got to address those costs. We also have to look at our investment in weapon systems. I, I would argue that we need to slow our investments in weapon systems that are tomorrow's system and increase our investments in the over-the-horizon systems, to look at what we can do more, not only as, as uh, we heard Wes Bush talk about, in research and development, preparing us for the world of 2030, but also look at how we can invest in things we know are going to be cutting-edge technology, robotics, uh, unmanned vehicles, not individually piloted unmanned vehicles, 
but fleet managed unmanned vehicles where we have autonomy and semi-autonomy available to use, unmanned submersibles, uh, directed energy weapons. These are things that sound very much like science fiction, but 12 years from now may be what the United States must have in order to defend our interests around the world. Finally, I'd say that we've got to look at our investment in people. Uh, the most important thing the military can do during this drawdown, in my estimation, is continue to keep the best and brightest in uniform. If we don't, and many of them are in this audience today, those, those young folks out there, many of them are wearing mufti today, but they're actually uh, officers in our military. So I'd invite you to talk to them and ask what makes them tick and why they're staying and what their decisions are in front of them. We've got to keep this skill set in the military. If during this coming drawdown, when we're coming out of these wars and we're seeing budgets go down, training opportunities decrease, micromanagement creeps in, if we don't keep the best talent in the military, we're going to be totally ill-equipped for dealing with the wars of the future. So to close, I'd take you back to where we started, back to the 1930s. And the foremost military in the world in the 1930s wasn't the US military, wasn't the Japanese military, it wasn't even the German military. In the 1930s, the nation who, who, is, who was known worldwide as having probably the most capable, most powerful military in the world was France. And in 1940, the French, with their version of defense, uh, ended up with an answer that looked like the Maginot Line. Uh, they had the best tanks in the world, and they had a lot of them. They had extremely capable aircraft, and they had them organized in certain ways. Uh, they had a lot of infantry formations. They had won the First World War, and Paris had been saved. And in six weeks, in 1940, their answer, the best military in the world's way to defend against the future, was outflanked by the Germans in a period of six weeks. Uh, and Paris fell. Up until that point in time, the French dominated the military capabilities around the world. They had the best of everything. But the Germans found combinations of capabilities and found ways to use even less capable systems in ways that rapidly defeated the, the French, made their entire system irrelevant. That's a very dangerous position to be in. That's a failure of imagination. And that's my worry of, about the United States as we look forward into this world of the future, that our imagination will be focused on our rearview mirror and not focused on the lens to our front. Thanks very much, and I look forward to talking with you all at lunch. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us for our networking lunch in the foyer outside the ballroom. Our meeting will reconvene.